Uh, so Emilio Reichert, as you know, is uh, the CEO of uh, Greentown Labs. And uh, in her role, she um, sets Greentown Labs strategic direction, focusing on increasing the organization's impact on clean energy uh, and efficient technology commercialization through entrepreneurship, uh, so supporting a lot of the startups that are coming into the field. Uh, she also directs uh, Greentown Labs efforts to engage new corporate or foundation partners to expand rec recognition and educational programs for clean technology entrepreneurs and to leverage local community uh, in, uh, here in Boston of entrepreneurs, investors, universities, government agencies, and NGOs striving to build a clean energy future. Uh, and also she's been uh, instrumental in uh, positioning Boston as a leader in, in, in this field, so we're really glad to have you. Um, prior to Greentown Labs, Emily was the Director of Business Operations at Warner Babcock Institute for Green Chemistry, where she helped grow the company from an angel-funded startup to a sustainable contract R&D business with a mission to minimize environmental impact of chemical processes and products. Uh, she has over 15 years of experience serving in research and development, business development and operations leadership roles. Uh, she was a PhD in physical chemistry and an MBA from MIT. So please join me in welcoming Emily Reichardt. So, um, it's a tradition to start uh, our conversation talking a little bit about uh, how you started in entrepreneurship. Were you always an entrepreneurial person? Mm -hmm. What were the, were the first experiences that, that, that uh, kind of led you to this path? Uh, we can probably talk about where you grew up and if that had any influence uh, in your path. Yeah, sure. So, um, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, great. So, I don't know that I actually grew up thinking I was ever going to be an entrepreneur. Um, I'm, I grew up in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, I don't think I knew any entrepreneurs. Uh, my dad was a doctor, my mom was a therapist, and I knew I was going to college, and that's basically all I knew. I, you know, it wasn't like it is today where everyone in every college wants to be an entrepreneur um, or wants to be part of a startup. That just wasn't where we were in the 80s and early 90s when back in the day when I was going to school. So um, I started school, college, uh, thinking that, well, I knew that, well, my dad was a doctor, my mom was a therapist, therefore I thought I would be a psychiatrist because that was the mixture of the two. And you know, what else did I know? And uh, ended up starting out so being a pre-med, and then um, you know decided I didn't really like dissecting and frog bones and uh, memorizing frog bones. No, memorizing frog parts is uh, the thing that kind of got to me. And my freshman roommate, because I would store the frog that was being dissected underneath my bed um, in my dorm room. Actually, just had my 20th college reunion, and she remembers this quite vividly. Um, so anyway, no real thoughts of that in the early years. Um, I joined, well, fast forwarding, so I went to college and ended up going into chemistry because I didn't really like the biology and I was already in the science track. And um, I had a mentor who I also just recently revisited during my college reunion of 20 years. Um, this chemistry professor that was uh, this short little lady uh, who smoked very skinny long cigarettes, wore tight black jeans, and swore all the time in the classroom. Uh, she became my mentor and asked me the question, How you, have you ever thought about doing chemistry graduate school? And no one in my family had done this, so I didn't know about it, but um, she kind of mentored me, and I ended up at the University of Wisconsin-Madison getting a PhD in physical chemistry. So um, again, no thought of entrepreneurship, no awareness, kind of decided during that time period that I should go into industry uh, because academia just really wasn't for me. I'm a person that needs to be around other people, and uh, being in a lab all the time didn't really do it for me. Uh, went into, after the PhD, came here to Boston to work for a company called Arthur D. Little, um, which is no longer in existence, but at the time it was a place to do science and engineering, uh, you know, helping large companies to solve big problems. And I was there for seven years, um, then joined another company doing green chemistry, uh, because I kind of found that along the way that was my transition from doing chemistry to green chemistry. And that company, um, as was mentioned in the intro, was when I joined it, roughly about seven people. I think I was employee number seven or eight. It was a 
person and his like seven graduate students and so I was the first person with management experience coming into the company and um, I got to help build that from seven or eight people to 40 something in two years and so that to answer your question finally um, is where I kind of developed the entrepreneurship bug because I liked being part of building something. That was very satisfying to me. I don't know if there's a theme there of like building molecules and building machinery, which is kind of what I did in my PhD um, program, and uh, building teams, you know, bigger teams and bigger teams, but eventually building companies seemed uh, like a very attractive, satisfying thing to do. So to kind of push that dream forward, I went back to graduate school again because I obviously love to be in school. I've done 21 years worth of school in my lifetime. Um, got the MBA uh, from the MIT program called the Sloan Fellows Program and that was really um, the point where I went from, okay, person with management experience plus a hard science degree to, okay, now I understand what they're talking about with investments and accounting and all these other things that seemed very mysterious until you realize they're all very simple concepts. Um, you know. And so I got the business degree really to be able to speak the language of business um, and went to Sloan to think about, okay, could I start a startup of my own in green chemistry, um, discovered green chemistry, clean technology, clean energy, and um, finally uh, found Greentown Labs um, while I was there. And uh, it was a place where there were a bunch of clean technology startups all in one place, and I thought, well, I could join one of those. And I turned out, um, instead of joining one of those, kind of came into uh, uh, running the organization Greentown Labs where I could help a whole bunch of startups. So my trip through entrepreneurship, I think, didn't, I didn't really find entrepreneurship or even understand entrepreneurship until halfway through my career, but now I think it's really an essential part of my being in terms of, again, building things. Um, I find that very fun. And um, I also just love the spirit of entrepreneurs. Great, so, so let's go a little bit into the story of uh, how you ended up at Greenton Labs and how, how that started. Uh, tell us about uh, how you met the founders and how it was like that, that, that initial moment when they said, okay, Emily, can you help us out? And, and you turn into a, you know, a, a key piece of where they are right now after uh, three years, right? So I mean, a little bit of that story would be great to understand. Sure, so um, it's kind of an interesting story. So as I was um, doing the program at MIT, um, I was looking for that startup company to join or start, uh, probably a clean tech startup, I didn't really know. And um, so I found, um, or I heard about this group of on entrepreneurs that was sharing space in a basement in South Boston. And there were about 15 companies. It was, I should say, very rough space. Um, so this place was, uh, there was no HVAC, there was no ventilation whatsoever, um, there was sawdust on the floor, it was underground, like literally two levels underground. You had to kind of walk down into a dungeon to get to it. And it was in one of these kind of old factory buildings from the turn of the century in South Boston, which until two or three years ago, you know, really actually, there was nothing there. There were no people there. It's amazing to think about that now when you look at how South Boston is just going nuts. But um, at the time, it was actually a little scary to walk around on Summer Street at night. But um, I found my way there, and I think when I walked into the room or into this building the first time, I had two thoughts. One was, this place is a death trap. And that was like my first like visceral response. Like, these people are gonna like get exploded or burnt up or you know the railings are unsafe. Everything about this situation just defies every lesson I've ever learned about corporate safety. And I learned a lot because I was a chemist um, in the lab all these years. And um, this, my second thought was though that I absolutely love this. There was just something very vibrant and visceral and an er energy and a spirit about what these guys were doing that was like palpable. You could totally feel the energy in there from the very like first moment I walked in. And so at that point, um, they, they was still being, Greentown Labs was founded by entrepreneurs. So there were four 
entrepreneur teams. They graduated from MIT. They didn't have space anymore to build prototypes. And they needed a space, just basically cheap rent. They went in on it together, started out in a warehouse in East Cambridge. That became this space in South Boston that I stumbled onto. And uh, those original four founders were still kind of running this organization in their spare time. Um, while well, they were also trying to build their startups. And that was really no longer working anymore, especially when the lead guy uh, started having, well, he didn't have his first baby. His wife had their first baby. And uh, it was pretty clear he wasn't really going to have the time to devote to even collecting the rent from all the other entrepreneurs. And so it was at that point that they knew they needed to bring someone on. I think their original idea was, we'll bring someone on to help us run events, and everything else will just continue to run itself. Um, you know, in the way that the operations were divided up, it was like someone ordered the toilet paper every month, someone else would, you know, order the beer for the events, and like it was just all distributed amongst the entrepreneurs, and you know, then you know, you'd see mice, and someone would have to extra special go out and get the mice mouse traps you know like there was there was a distribution of labor that was very much like a co-op um, you know where everyone felt like they had a part of this community and this um, you know space and this organization something that we've tried very hard to keep um, as we grow you know that culture of, of having a strong community where everyone pitches in um, so I kind of wandered in at exactly the right time. Now, the problem was that even though they knew they needed to bring someone on to run this and grow this, or at least control it, um, they didn't have any money to do that. So, uh, you know, the first question was, okay, well, we need someone, but we don't have any way to pay you. You're going to have to raise your own salary. And, um, you know, by the way, the other problem is that, um, you know, by the time I got there, there were only three months left on the lease in South Boston, and by that time, the real estate market was going nuts, and, you know, we didn't know where we were going to live. We didn't know how we were going to pay for wherever it is we were going to live, and all of that um, needed to be figured out. So I, in my entrepreneurial period, which started, um, you know, when I went to MIT, and, uh, you know, my husband and I kind of decided, well, this is your entrepreneurial period. We won't worry so much about whether you're getting paid. And um, I have a nice steady job, so go for it. And so I went for it. And um, so just really started out. There was no money. Um, I'll, I should take that back. There were, I did pay an intern to help me that first semester, or that first um, when I got there in February of 2013. So she got paid and I didn't. And um, you know, it was just like, all hands on deck trying to figure out where, where we were going to move because this lease was going to be up in a couple months. And so I just kind of dived in. At the meantime, we were still needing to run this operation. You know, there were more companies coming in. There were absolutely, um, you know, so many things. I mean, just the, the little things like birds getting into the building and, um, you know, I, I don't know. There's just an endless series of like, I started learning like running a facility is a real pain in the ass and you know if you can avoid that in your future career you should absolutely do that because it's just it's endless problems. Um, but in any case uh, so I found my way in uh, through that they I have to say that um, at the beginning I, I felt like they weren't quite wanting to release the control of the organization to a new person, but over time, I think every single one of those original entrepreneurs is just like so glad that the organization has had the chance to grow and prosper, um, you know, under someone who had the time and um, the interest in doing it. So, really took off from there. Great. So, so you ended up in Somerville. Tell us about where you are now, the space, mm -hmm. uh, how many companies are now. I read something that was not that recent. There was more than 100 million. I think it's much more than that now. So tell us about Green Lab, Greentown Labs today. Sure. So uh, Greentown Labs today is 50 companies, um, all sharing space in our location in Somerville, Massachusetts, which is, um, well, I rode my bike here tonight. It's about two miles from here. So it is a great location for the type of entrepreneurs that we support at Greentown Labs. Uh, those companies share 40,000 square feet of space, and most of that space is laboratory space. And that 
was the need of the original entrepreneurs. You know, they were kind of getting together to share lab space because they were kicked out of their university labs because they graduated. And it is still really the core of what we offer today is that lab space that they can get inexpensively and they can build prototypes and test those prototypes in a real world environment. That's kind of what they're doing while they're there. Uh, you know, other than the lab, we have a big open office area. You know, a similar, many co-working spaces uh, look like our co-working space where it's a bunch of desks. Entrepreneurs kind of sit in pods where their team all sits together. And so there might be a team of six here and a team of two here and a team of 20 over there. Um, and they kind of sit together within their teams. It's very open and that is very purposeful. We only have very short walls. So no one has an office, not even me. Um, the space is just open. And I think the value in that is very much that if you're there in the, you know, at 11 o'clock at night and you can look across the room and see some other poor soul there at 11 o'clock at night, you kind of know you're not crazy. And I think that that's important in terms of building the vibe of, of community and you know, people understanding that what they're working on is important and someone else is trying just as hard as you are. Um, the other thing I can tell you about is uh, we have a very active 3,000 square foot event space and it's similar to what we're sitting in right now. It is the place where we gather continuously every single day for events, for lunch, for town halls, for events with our sponsors and partners and it's just a continuous place where it's just kind of buzzing. There's always something going on in our event space and it also is very open and um, a place where people can kind of do whatever they want too. I mean, we let our entrepreneurs pretty much do whatever they want. Um, so they just have to tell us ahead of time, hey, I'm going to set up a band over there in the corner and we're having a, you know, some kind of event to celebrate that we raised a round of funding. Um, that's totally fine. And so it's, it's a very flexible space, um, both in the lab, in the co-working space, and um, in the event space. So that's basically what it looks like. So we were talking earlier, before we started, about um, uh, Green Labs being an incubator and mm -hmm. the distinction between that and accelerator. Mm -hmm. So tell us a bit about how is Green Town Labs different from all the other uh, type of uh, entities that are supporting startups uh, in Boston. Sure. So I can kind of back up a little bit and just talk about where startups come from that end up at Greentown Labs. So typically they come out of a university research lab. So someone has an idea and that idea often comes out of the lab with a faculty member and maybe a student or two. And someone enters it in a business plan competition. That's a pretty common thing. Um, you know, there's an MIT Clean Energy Prize. There's a BU competition. There's a Tufts competition. All these universities seem to have them now. And that really forces you to write a business plan and think about what your application and what your market's going to be for this technology. Um, a lot of times the winners of those will then go on to an accelerator program. So we in this area are just totally blessed to have uh, you know, tons and tons of different accelerator programs. So there's Mass Challenge, there's Techstars, there's the Bolt Accelerator, there's um, the Clean Tech Open Accelerator, um, there's the MIT Global Skills Accelerator. So all of these programs are places where you can be, uh, you can access very intensive training for a limited amount of time. So it's kind of like you, you start, usually have an application process, and then you're in there, you're getting all kinds of intensive mentoring, and um, then it's over. And at that point, you should be able to raise seed funding. Well, if you're a software startup company, then maybe at that point, you're done. You have a product, you can raise some funding, you move into your own space, and it's all good. If you're a hardware company, which is the type of companies that we help, you're just getting started. And so typically, Companies raise a little seed funding and then they come to Greentown Labs and then they build their prototype, they test their prototype, they eventually build a beta product, they test those beta products in a real world environment and um, they tend to stay with us for 18 to 22 months roughly. And while they're there, they're doing, uh, finding their first customers, they are testing the product and they are thinking about manufacturing and learning how to manufacture the product. So. The incubator, I think, very specifically helps companies get from the prototype stage 
to really the first customer and this Series A round of investment, so maybe your five to 15 million type round of investment. At Greentown Labs is different from most other incubators because we have a strong focus on clean technology. So all of our companies have to fill out a application that you know, basically says, how is your company going to change the world in terms of environment um, and energy? What's gonna be the impact um, on the earth? And that absolutely will get you in or not get you into <laughs> Greentown Labs. Um, and we have a lot of companies that kind of try and we're like, mm, yeah, um, you're doing something great, but you're just not really a fit. Um, so we find that uh, companies that have that high impact mission along with the, uh, along with the passion to you know, build the startup, they share something in common that allows them to be a very strong, allows them to be part of a very strong community and to work together. So I'd say most of our entrepreneurs are very like-minded. They care about the same things. They care about profit, but they also care about you know, doing something good for the world. And that's kind of what draws the community together. So I'd say um, our industry focus, our community, and then our ability to provide the lab space that companies building clean technology, which is often hardware focused. Those are kind of three things about us that I'd say are pretty unique. So maybe, maybe this is more like kind of two questions in one, but so is it typically engineers, mostly engineers that come or are there social scientists that could have an impact or is, or is, it, is it mostly, like you said, people directly from the lab or is it, is it diverse or even within engineering, is it mostly you know, electrical engineers? Who, who is the, the typical entrepreneur that uh, ends up being, or is there a typical entrepreneur that ends up being in Greentown Labs? Yeah, so I'd say the vast majority of our population is mechanical engineers. And then there's electrical engineers, there's civil engineers. Um, mechanical engineers are great because they'll fix stuff for us. <laughs> so like we have all kinds of you know, various facilities issues and you're like, does anyone know how to hang this or does anyone know how to like reprogram this thermostat or does anyone know how to do this or that? And they're great with helping. And we actually have a community service requirement in our contracts with these companies that they need to do devote four hours per month per team, four hours per month per team, and there's 50 teams, um, to helping out at Greentown Labs and having a bunch of mechanical engineers around who are very handy with all kinds of different things um, really helps that. So they're that. And then the other probably big population is business uh, oriented folks. So they may be fresh out of business school, that's a lot of them, um, but they also may be more senior folks that are coming in to be the executives of these companies. Because typically while they're with us, they're building out that executive team, um, whereas they might have just started with two founders, and then while they're there, they're growing the team generally, but they're kind of looking for that um, first executive team while they're with us. So you also mentioned that um, uh, Green Labs is focused on green technology or clean technology. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about that, what, what, the definition of clean technology or green technology. Mm -hmm. Uh, when, when I hear those words, I find I imagine a wide range of applications, and but they seem to be a typical one like solar energy, wind energy, uh, carbon emissions. So, what, what are we? Are there any additional technologies? You talk about mainly hardware, but are there people that are combining hardware with software with analytics? What does it mean to be a green or a clean tech startup today? So, clean technology is very broad as a category. Um, so it's definitely, I mean, the things that people think about, of course, are solar and wind. Those are very um, obvious kind of standard examples that you think about. But clean technology really encompasses a lot of other technologies as well. So basically, it's using resources in a more efficient way um, and or you're reducing the amount of waste that's going into the environment. That's kind of how I define it broadly. So resource efficiency. So that can be anything from, uh, you know, the solar and wind, which is about using energy more efficiently, or generating energy more efficiently, um, all the way to uh, water. So it turns out that whenever you create fresh water, it requires a lot of energy to do that. Um, lots of different types of energy generation require a lot of water, so there's this interesting nexus around water and energy. Um, we also have quite a few companies that are in agriculture, so agriculture is, um, of course, an area where there is lots of waste. 
um, whether it be water, chemicals, um, you know, nutrient, all these different things that really need to be monitored, monitored and used more efficiently. So agriculture, uh, recently a lot of our companies are coming in in robotics. And so those are mostly making use of more efficient supply chains and more efficient manufacturing processes. So that is also reducing the amount of energy used. It's often reducing uh, you know, the amount of chemicals or other environmental impacts. Uh, so broadly defined resource efficiency and um, really a bigger impact on the environment. And um, so let's say I, I, I fit. I'm, a, I'm an entrepreneur and I have an idea and I, I think I fit. What would I expect? You mentioned the community and the space and the lab. Uh, am I going to get a, is there a program that comes with it? Uh, are you going to help me find investors? Are you going to help me, um, you know, bring, are there engineers on staff that help me build my prototype? What are the resources that Greentown Lab offers? Would you invest in me? Am I going to give equity being part? What, what's the model and what do I get when I apply and are part of the experience? Yeah. So, um, first I guess the financial model. So, Greentown Labs does not take equity. Um, that's really because we started out founded by entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs generally don't like to give up equity and we just kind of kept that as um, the way that we do things. Um, instead, we charge rent. So, our entrepreneurs pay per desk and they pay per square foot in the lab and that seems to work out well for everyone. It covers our operational costs and also gives them what I would call some skin in the game to be part of the community. Um, so at the bare minimum, what we're offering is space, laboratory space and um, you know, office space and a community of entrepreneurs who are like-minded. I'd say that's a very important part of our offering. We also have uh, a continuous stream of different um, investors and strategic corporate partners and um, you know, professional resources like lawyers and accountants and HR people and PR people and many, many others who are holding a stream of office hours and other and educational programming. We offer companies all in all about $130,000 per company of kind of free professional services, software, um, some hardware, and all of that is yours when you walk in the door, when you get accepted to Greentown Labs. So you have access to SolidWorks software, which would otherwise cost you $20,000 know, for your company, so that you get that for free. So that's a, an example. Um, in terms of programming, a lot of our programming is really community oriented. So we strongly believe that entrepreneurs can mentor each other. So first and foremost, we like to try to make connections amongst our entrepreneurs because someone who just raised funds is actually going to be your best resource in how to do that um, rather than someone that maybe did it 20 years ago and is maybe a little out of touch with, with how term sheets are done today. So we create forums. For example, we have a fundraising roundtable. Our fundraising roundtable meets like once maybe every month and companies take turns pitching to each other. They tune up their presentations and they get advice from, say, a more experienced entrepreneur who has already raised funds. And so we create lots of forums like that. We also have um, a monthly forum called Town Hall, which is a place where we bring the whole community together and we do kind of interactive games and programs to try to get people connected. Um, we're launching right now kind of a internet system which will allow companies to understand uh, you know what is the entire talent base in the community because we love it if we can connect um, entrepreneurs with other entrepreneurs within the organization who can provide them a set of skills that they can't afford right now to put on their team. So rather than everyone having to hire a certain kind of engineer or a certain kind of software programmer or an expert in this or that type of test chamber, um, there's probably that expertise somewhere in this community. And so making those connections is really, really important. So I'd say um, at Greentown, you're getting the space, you're getting the community and the peer support. And then on top of that, we're providing you with a lot of resources that are going to make whatever you're doing less expensive for you. And um, you know, we're just going to continuously be connecting you to um, a whole bunch of people that can help you move forward faster. Let's talk a little bit about the the investing investing part, and I think mm -hmm. and so 
Uh, you mentioned some partners. What, what type of investors are attracted to mm -hmm. to companies that are in the clean tech space? And there's been a lot of, I mean, maybe I'm, I'm reading in the wrong places, but uh, a lot of information that suggests that there's less investment for energy-oriented companies. Uh, and you hear more information about opportunities coming from the government. Or, mm -hmm. So what are the resources and why would investors be attracted that might not know about Greentown Labs, mm -hmm. uh, that they know that they, they should be involved? Yeah, so um, just from the Greentown perspective, so we have a portfolio of about 100 investors that we interact with on a regular basis and we bring them through for office hours. So our companies are constantly getting exposed to folks that are interested in investing in energy. Those can be angel investors, they might be venture capitalists, they might be seed funds, they might be accelerator programs. So all of those, we kind of are constantly making introductions um, so that folks, there aren't a lot of investors in energy, so we try to curate those that are active um, and share that information with our companies and make those connections. Um, in terms of clean tech funding as a whole, um, there was a big boom in this in 2006, 7, and 8. Uh, everything green was good, and Silicon Valley came rushing in like they do um, in the herd mentality. And um, they got burned because a lot of them didn't know anything about energy or that it was very capital intensive or that, um, yeah, there was just a lot of really dumb investments. And we're still paying for that today in terms of the number of investments that are made in clean technology. So what I think they learned belatedly is this industry requires a lot of specialized expertise. So it's not everyone can understand you know, what a consumer app does, you know, helps you get your lunch faster or whatever it is that it does. Um, but everyone cannot understand how an energy storage chemical reaction happens and whether that's better than another chemical reaction for an energy storage application. So it requires a lot of technical expertise. It tends to be more capital intensive. And so, you know, again, this goes back to um, whether these investments were a good idea at the time when there was the clean tech boom. Uh, but, you know, it just can never be a good idea to, to build a factory in Silicon Valley, but yet that's kind of what, like, Solyndra, if you've heard that name, that's what they were proposing, and that's where money was going. Um, so I think today's clean technology entrepreneurs are actually a heck of a lot smarter. They're doing things lighter. Uh, they're doing things with less money. They're contracting out things. They're coming up with innovative business models. And so I'd say that that problem or that feeling that you know, there's no investment in clean tech is not exactly right. I'd say the investment in clean tech is smarter and different than it was you know, five or six years ago. Um, unfortunately, Silicon Valley has still decided that the word clean tech is bad. And so a lot of companies who are doing things for a clean tech or impact purpose have to disguise their companies to say, well, I'm something else. Um, I'm consumer software, or I'm this or that, so that um, you know, they can get the investment from uh, these investors who have that in their head. So the answer, I think, is that there is investment out there. I mean, we've had 10 Series A's in the past two years. So there is money. Um, I think it's out there for good companies with good business models um, who have done their homework and done the right thing. So I'd say there's a lot of people interested. And then there's all these different initiatives, uh, many of which have jumped off from the or were announced during the Paris climate change talks last December, like the Breakthrough Energy Initiative, where Bill Gates and a whole bunch of other folks um, have decided to put $20 billion into clean technology. Um, we're still trying to figure out how to access that money, as is everyone else in our field, but um, it's been pledged, so it is out there. Uh, the government, uh, the US government, has also uh, put forward uh, initiatives to invest in both clean technology development and deployment. So there is money out there. Um, it's not always easy for entrepreneurs to find. Um, but they do have, um, you know, they do get grants from both the federal and the state level. Um, they do find investors. And, um, you know, they do the things that all other entrepreneurs do, which is, you know, they start out with the friends and the family and they kind of build from there. So the money is out there. It's just hard to find. 
Great. So you, you, you touched on a couple of topics. I want to come back to the first one being uh, the branding, right, of, of green technology. And so you just mentioned companies having to disguise themselves <laughs> and present more as a consumer software. Mm -hmm. what, what would be good advice for companies that are trying to, okay, we're dealing with, with uh, maybe uh, for some, uh, not only investors, but for some audiences, mm -hmm. hard science, but which is a very interesting concept. How, how do you recommend... Um, for entrepreneurs and startups to think about branding and presenting the, mm -hmm. the their their startups and their business models and their what their company is doing in a in a in an interesting and, and really appealing way. Um, that's a good question. So, in, I mean, at the from the clean tech perspective, I think you have to go where your market is. So, if your customer cares about clean tech, then you want to sell your product that way. Um, if your customer doesn't care about clean tech and instead is, instead is more interested in cost savings, then that's probably the way you're going to sell your product. Um, you know, and your investors are of course going to influence the way that you sell your product as well. So, I think it all goes back to whether or not you have a good story. And you know, most of the entrepreneurs we work with have very good stories, very good ability to kind of share that bigger vision, but then also narrow it down to this is what that product can actually do for you, Mr. and Mrs. Customer. So I think that, um, you know, I advise companies to, to keep their big vision, which they almost all of them in our field come in with that, like almost save the world type vision. Keep that in your head but figure out what it is that your customer or your investor needs to hear to move you forward. And a lot of times you may have to take a sidestep from, you know, I want to change the way food is grown all over the globe to I want to, you know, or I need to develop an aquaponics system for consumer products or for um, consumer, a consumer application. You may need to start somewhere that, um, you know, kind of makes sense as a jumping off point. But then you can always go back to your bigger vision. And I think that bigger vision is kind of what drives you. Um, and in, ter in, terms of, in terms of the, um, the influences of potentially access to resources for bigger vision or, or uh, you know, um, support for uh, a lot of startups, H how important is the government in terms of, and I would say speaking about maybe uh, even for Greentown Labs finding support in local government, state government, national government, or going global, mm -hmm. how important, you mentioned the, 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 me the, the global meeting for, for the environment, so how important is understanding government and regulation and mm. because it seems that a lot of energy is, is dealt at that at those level decision making mm -hmm. it might not be the audience immediately for your startup but how important and and sub uh, government being for uh, i would say for you as an organization to support them and then the entrepreneurs yeah well it's interesting you ask about that because something that we are trying to figure out how to do is get our entrepreneurs more resources around understanding regulations um you know, if you have a new product that's going to go on the electricity grid that has to be reliable and dependable for all of us to be able to you know, power all the things we do every day, um, that thing has to be, you know, very finely defined within a set of parameters that make it safe. And as someone coming out of a research lab at MIT, you may or may not know what those parameters are or should be. So one thing that we're actually trying to do is bring at least state level regulators into Greentown Labs uh, to help advise our companies on how they can create products that are, uh, you know, can actually solve the problem and not get to the point where they're trying to sell something to a utility and suddenly like, well, we can never do something like that. That would be unsafe or that just doesn't make sense. So there's actually a lot of experts we bring in to help have companies um, kind of uh, be able to think through things earlier, like manufacturing would be another example of that. Uh, just in general to talk about government, I think um, you know, the government in the US uh, at the federal level, uh, there's really, there are big initiatives, but I think it's uh, mainly through small business grants that um, the entrepreneurs in our shop are helped. Uh, state government is very supportive. There are lots of programs uh, for clean technology at the state level. Um, local level, I can tell you that the city of Somerville is super happy to be 
having a green technology incubator uh, in Somerville and in fact has created a green technology program to test uh, some of our startups and other green tech products um, in Somerville buildings. So I would say the, the support there is um, very active and um, they're very willing to be experimental. And I think that's becoming more and more true with municipalities and state governments. Uh, they're willing to try more things. It's, it's kind of a trend right now to be able to offer that up to startups. And so we hope to see more of that. So you mentioned Somerville and, 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 and the state level uh, governments. So uh, why is Boston special? Why did Green Tech Labs have? Is, is, is this something to do with Boston? Mm -hmm. Why is it special for Green Tech technologies? Uh, are there other hubs in the country or around the world that you're aware of mm -hmm. that are centers for this type of uh, uh, um, communities? And why is that? Why, why are those spaces spe special for this type of industry? So I'd say Boston is one of the most Strong, the strongest clean technology ecosystems in the country. Um, it absolutely is probably in the top two or three. The other strong places in our country are uh, Silicon Valley, of course, although it's more geographically diverse, uh, spread out. And um, Texas would be another one, Colorado, um, the kind of Denver area, Chicago, up into the southern part of uh, Wisconsin are all where there's kind of clusters of activity going on. But uh, I think Boston is particularly strong because we have so many resources and so much focus on helping startups in such a small geographic area. So we've got all our universities, which are kind of pumping out new ideas and innovations and startups. We've got a lot of presence of um, you know investors just in general and other startup support resources like accelerator programs and uh, incubators we've got a government that is actually quite favorable in terms of policies uh, towards clean technology and we've got a lot of corporates and even more coming like GE who are interested in these technologies um, so you know all of those factors mean that this is a very, very fruitful area for clean technology development and for startups to be. Uh, you can imagine if you are kind of in the middle of somewhere where there aren't all these resources, it's just a lot harder because you have to figure everything out yourself and you also kind of have to be always reaching from away from your current geography to where those resources are. So we have a, we're very lucky actually. Um, and as Greentown Labs looks to expand in the next year, we're going to be um, creating another, um, actually, we're moving our headquarters kind of across an alleyway, so not too far, also in Somerville, uh, to a new building that we're going to be moving into. And so this will give us a total of 100, roughly 100,000 square feet, up from 40, which we are now. And we'll be able to accommodate about 100 startups. And we expect that many of those startups will be coming from places other than the US based on interest that's already here. Um, people that are already reaching out to us, groups that are coming from all over the world to learn about clean technology development and how it's done. And I mean, the argument to them is, come, we have an amazing ecosystem here. If you decide to grow your company in clean tech in the Boston area, you're gonna move so much faster than if you're doing it on your own somewhere else where there is not a strong ecosystem. So I think that um, we are actually ahead in many ways and a very strong baseline for people to build off of. Do you have partnerships with those hubs? Uh, can people come and go? travel from those places, exchange, and I guess there are resources that are different, I'm guessing, different verticals in each of those places. So do you have some of those relationships? Yeah, so in the U.S., um, we have relationships with about 10 different clean tech incubators around the country. And so our entrepreneurs, in most cases, can go and be in those incubators and be immediately connected to the resources in those areas. So we have a partner in Silicon Valley, one in L.A., one in Hawaii, Chicago, um, Detroit, Austin, New York City, I'm probably forgetting a few, but um, all those places, if one of our entrepreneur, entrepreneurs needs to go and fly into or drive to New York City and meet with an investor, they have a home. And they also have kind of instant connections to all of the people that that entrepreneurial ecosystem has at its disposal. 
So that is um, a network that we've kind of set up for ourselves in the US. Uh, we plan to do that internationally as well in the next uh, year or so, and we're already interacting with an incubator in the UK and um, a couple in France. Great. So let's talk a little bit about some of the cool technologies at Greentown Lab, some of the startups that are doing amazing stuff. Can you give us a few examples of some of the uh, companies that are trying to disrupt uh, the energy space and the clean tech space, and what can we expect from the lab uh, in, the near, in the near future? Yeah, so I think uh, you know, the common factor that we are seeing is the use of, you know, and forgive the buzzword, Internet of Things to address clean technology challenges. So all kinds of different sensors that are helping you to understand your situation better and therefore make better decisions um, regarding energy use, regarding water use, um, regarding, you know, all kinds of different resource use. I think also, um, you know, so a few examples of that would be, and one of my personal favorites, although I shouldn't have any favorites, um, we have a company that is doing, um, well, they call it the data moran. It is a catamaran, a robotic catamaran that goes out on the ocean and measures data about the wind, um, about moisture, about wave conditions, about weather conditions, um, and basically maps the ocean um, and creates data that allows you to do things like site wind turbines more effectively for offshore wind um, and other applications where you really, really, really need to know um, what the conditions are out in the ocean. And so this catamaran basically goes out, it's solar powered, and it can uh, just collect this data, whereas before you would have had a guy in a boat you know, kind of driving back and forth with sensors. And now you can do that from one stationary location and instead um, this robot goes out and collects that data for you. Um, another fun example is uh, a company that we have that is developing high altitude wind turbines. And uh, this is a little bit wild and if you ever want to go online and see something cool, you should go check out Alteros Energies. So the idea here is that the winds, um, well, everyone says the problem with wind energy, right, is that it's not always windy. So you have intermittent, an intermittent energy source. So it turns out that when you get high enough up um, in the atmosphere, and not that high up, it's like a kilometer up, you have pretty much constant winds all the time, day and night. And so if you could access that wind, then you would have an energy source that is basically always on. And so this team out of MIT and Harvard has developed a high altitude wind turbine. So it basically floats, the turbine floats inside a helium balloon and then is connected back to the ground at, through a base station. And so the applications of this, now you can't just float these things around everywhere because uh, there might be a little problem with FAA, you know, like airplanes running into them. But imagine you are on a remote island, um, for example, like there has been some deployed in Alaska, uh, where it's hard to get any kind of energy to that location without trucking in a bunch of diesel or shipping in a, a bunch of diesel fuel. That's the only way that you're able to get power. So instead, you set up a couple of these wind turbines and you can power, you know, tens and twenties and however many hundreds of homes. And so that's one example. The other thing you can use these for is disaster. So imagine, um, God forbid, uh, you have a hurricane and it knocks out power and suddenly none of us have cell phones and you're trying to reach people. So you can deploy one of these uh, high altitude wind turbines in less than a day. And that allows you to get energy, which then can be used to power a cell turbine a cell phone tower um, in a time of emergency. So there's lots of interesting applications for that as well. Great, so uh, maybe one last question and we let uh, the audience uh, address you. Um, maybe I would like to ask you, talk about expansion. Uh, how do you see your business model and Greentown Labs evolving in the, in the near and long, long term future? What are your dreams, your goals for Greentown Labs? You mentioned the new space, but mm -hmm. a little bit further down the road, what are your, your, your dreams for, for Greentown Labs? Um, well, my big dream in general is to be able to be a seed for creating ecosystems like Boston's all over the world. And so to create a whole bunch of small ecosystems um, in parts, 
everywhere in the world so that you're creating clean technology not just in one place but in many other places. So how would you do that? Well in the next two years um, we're very much focused on Somerville and Boston. We're expanding, we need to stay focused and we need to, to grow and um, really make the programs that we have here in Boston as strong as possible. But we're now going to suddenly have additional space, which is a very rare thing at Greentown Labs. Right now we're full, we've been full for a year and a half with a waiting list. And um, so now we have the opportunity to, to interact with people from all over the world who are interested in clean technology development. So how does that work? Well, what we envision is having exchange programs where entrepreneurs from, say, a country like France or the UK or India or China or um, Kenya come and spend time at Greentown Labs. So maybe there is a six month period where you bring entrepreneurs to Greentown Labs and we send some there as well from all over the US perhaps through a contest. So what does that accomplish? Well, if you do that and you immerse entrepreneurs in an environment like Greentown Labs, like the ecosystem in Boston, you necessarily are teaching people about how to be part of that ecosystem, about the things that make an, e an ecosystem work. And then you send them back and you do this over and over and over again through years of programs. I have to imagine that in all of these places where we're doing exchange programs, you're then seeding very much a new ecosystem, a new set of people who understands how this kind of it, it, um, interchange and sharing and interaction happens and grows from there. So I see us almost creating a whole bunch of little tiny starting points of Greentown Labs, just like when there were just the four entrepreneurs sharing space in our, when we started. That could be created in so many different places around the world that we're having, we're doing these exchanges, creating ecosystems everywhere where clean technology is being developed. So that's, that's what I hope that we can end up doing um, over the long term. Great. So let me, let me then hand off the mic to anybody who has questions. Hi, Andy Lyons, Possibility Partners. And I love Greentown Labs. My IQ goes up at least 10 points whenever I walk <laughs> in the building. <laughs> so many smarty pants in there. It's wonderful. But how, what is Greentown Labs' revenue model? I mean, I know that you make money off the renting of the desks, mm -hmm. but are you, do you rate, um, how did you get your salary? <laughs> and how do you continue to you know, have revenue coming in? I'm curious. Yeah, so uh, we are sustainable. Our operations are sustainable on rents that we charge entrepreneurs. So we charge slightly below market rates, mm -hmm. um, but we are in Somerville, so it's not that expensive. Uh, and we you know, basically occupy a big warehouse. So you know, I guess it's, not, it's not like Cambridge or Boston, you know, $54 a square foot type rates. Um, we also have a lot of corporate sponsors. So we have about 35 different um, corporate sponsors. A few are in kind, but most of them are providing funds that allow us to keep the rent low for entrepreneurs. Are those the ones on the big wall in your yes, space? Okay. exactly. And then about 10% of our funds comes from the state government. Okay, great. Thank you. So two months ago, the uh, CEO of the Bolt came here, and he was mm -hmm. talking about his business. Um, what's the difference between the service that you are offering for your startup uh, people and what Bolt is doing for them? Because it's more hardware mm -hmm. oriented. Mm -hmm. So I think Bolt provides a really strong service around uh, companies that are building hardware, where they have um, engineers on site to help companies who they've invested in uh, really get their product to a point where it can be manufactured. So the focus there is hardware of any type. Um, they focus on companies that they're investing in. So that's, that's really the key thing. And then most of those companies are going to manufacture their products in China. So in Greentown Labs, we have an industry focus. So all of our companies are doing clean technology. Um, our companies, we actually try to connect them to manufacturers who are local. 
So we have a specific program to help connect them to um, manufacturers in places like Lowell or um, you know, Springfield or other places around the Commonwealth because we actually have a really kick-ass um, you know, high-tech manufacturing base here in the state and no one knows about it. There is a lot going on here and it is not a lot more expensive and it is a heck of a lot more convenient. So our focus is really making these local connections. Eventually, if it's a high volume product, yes, it will end up in China, but um, in terms of what we do with companies, we try to, to keep the focus local. And then, um, you know, I think the other thing is that we are not taking equity in our companies, um, we don't invest in them, and that kind of leaves the relationship a little more open. We don't need to push companies through as fast. We can let them kind of grow on their own time scale. Um, we've noticed that companies that, you know, it's roughly proportional to the size of the device or the piece of hardware they're, they're building is the amount of time they need in our incubator. So if you are building a tabletop device, size device, that might take you nine months or 12 months before you can raise your Series A and get, a lot, get out. Um, for a company that's building a high altitude wind turbine that fits up, fills up an entire um, hangar of an Air Force base, you know, that takes four years. And so we have a lot of flexibility to allow our entrepreneurs to take the time they need to move that company forward. Um, and that additional flexibility comes from not needing to make the next investment. So we can allow our entrepreneurs kind of more flexibility. But I think Bold is fantastic. A lot of times our companies go over there, get some support and help on specifically kind of getting their product to the next level, and then they come back. And that actually happens with a lot of programs in the Boston area. We're very collaborative, actually. I think that's what makes our ecosystem great, is all these accelerator programs and incubators, we all work together. I mean, we all are friends. And so it's not like, you know, Bolt is a competitor of Greentown. Bolt is a partner of Greentown. And we, you know, and when our companies get into Bolt, we're like, oh, that's exciting. You guys are going to have, you know, you're going to be helped and that you're, it's going to make your company stronger. And that's a good thing for everyone. Thank you. Hi, Emily. Hey. My name is Uriel. It was very interesting uh, hearing uh, your interview. And um, my question is, can you uh, describe what differentiates a green company's uh, success to failure in your um, in your lab? Um, so, how do we know when it's successful? Is what differentiates what a successful company, a successful uh, startup, to a non-successful one? Well, I mean, there are. <laughs> There's, I think, two ways to look at that. Uh, so in our lab, it becomes very obvious when a company is not moving forward uh, because their, their lab space becomes what we refer to as storage space or a company becomes in the storage state, which basically means nothing is happening in the, the prototyping space. And you kind of know that because it starts filling up with, you know, junk and like there's just nothing going on. So that's a very uh, visible sign that things are stalled. And so that's that type of company where then we go and we try to give very specific help. We try to understand, you know, what's going on, what's, what's holding you up. Um, a lot of times it's things that are out of their control, but they're still trying to move forward and we respect that and we kind of help them do that. Um, but sometimes it's just, uh, you know, a barrier that can't be met. I mean, sometimes you discover your technology already has a patent on it from someone else and you have no freedom to operate or that the technology doesn't work in the way that you thought it would and that is going to kind of kill the original application um, that you had in mind. So uh, that's kind of the, the visual. Um, you know, in the general sense, companies need to continue to raise money. If they don't continue to raise money and grow the team and continue to prototype and demonstrate that those prototypes are better than the previous one, then you know they're not growing. So I'd say success is when you continue to raise money and you know grow your team and grow your company. Hi, 
is is the uh, Greentown Labs, is that like, can people visit it? Can we just from the public come and see it? Do you put on seminars, you know? So we have a monthly free event called our Energy Bar, which is open to the public. And that is a networking event. It's the first Thursday of every month um, from 5.30 to 8.30 p.m. And um, that's, you know, we serve beer, appetizers, and uh, it's just an opportunity to meet entrepreneurs and other interesting people that are you know, excited about clean technology. So that would be my suggestion if you want to come check us out. Um, you might be able to convince one of my staff to give you a tour as well. Hi, my name is Gustavo, and um, I'm wondering, like, so when you started, uh, how long did it take you to um, get up to like 50 members and you know how long did it take you to become profitable mm -hmm. and how do you do it like how do you go and sell the space and the incubator? Um, somewhat lucky that the space and the entrepreneurial community sell themselves a bit um, so let's see when did we become profitable that is how a very long, good question. How long did it take you like so we filled up um, within 15 months of moving to our space in Somerville. So we went from less than half full to bursting um, in about 15 months. So that, um, and then we were profitable probably before that point. So I don't know, 12, a year maybe? Okay. Yeah. Um, but profitable in the sense of like our whole revenue picture so not just the rents but the sponsorships and the government grants right, that like whole breaking revenue. even like, yeah right. mm -hmm. so probably about a year okay and how um, how did you do the the business development so they you mm -hmm. said the startups would come to you mm -hmm. or you reached out to them yeah so that's a that's a good question um, so when we were needing to get full uh, we did actually do quite a bit of outreach and so we went to um, lots of competitions where there were startups like uh, the clean energy prize we went to all the accelerator programs that were graduating new startups uh, we came up with a big long list of like clean tech startups in the boston area and then we brought 105 of them in four tours and so we that's it was a, actually one intern that did that um, she created the we had a crm we were like go for it, and she just had sales in her blood, and uh, she just brought all these companies in, and so that is actually, I credit that for filling us up. I mean, that and, you know, just the, the growing value of the brand and kind of getting our name out there and the events and all these different things. Um, we were lucky to get a lot of press, I think, um, you know, through, because we're doing interesting stuff and our companies are doing interesting stuff, and then that kind of creates more buzz and, and so uh, we did do some very active business development on that front. In terms of uh, just ongoing revenue though, we have a full-time person, well, I guess he spends about 75% of his time on what we refer to as the member pipeline. So as we meet new companies, we put them in our CRM, we check in with them, we invite them to events. And so we're kind of constantly priming the pump, so to speak. Uh, on our other revenue fronts, we have a full-time person that works on our sponsor portfolio. So that is another, that is a lot of work and um, requires kind of constant maintenance and feeding and thinking about, well, how do these sponsors interact and work with our companies so that they're providing value not only to Greentown in terms of money, but in terms of you know, what they can provide the startups, whether it's mentoring or, you know, potential for investment or free software or whatever it is that they're providing. So, so we have a business development person who is pretty much focused full-time on the sponsor portfolio. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Christy. Mm -hmm. um, so I found it so interesting that investors are hesitant to invest in clean tech. I find that so surprising. I, I wasn't aware of that. So do you f are you finding that some of the startup um, startups are having are distracted or have a disconnect between their product and the vision they had when they have to disguise really their the name or the the language around what they're bringing to market? 
I think that um, most of them know at the at their gut level why they're doing what they're doing, and it's kind of a necessary evil, so to speak. You need to fit into a framework that an investor can understand and justify to themselves, uh, and that's just the way it is. It's just kind of, I mean, I think that probably all companies that have to pitch themselves to investors in any field, probably it's not necessarily their original vision. It's, it's based on the feedback they hear and that, that pushes them in a certain direction or to try a certain, you know, beachhead market or, or application first, mm -hmm. you know, versus maybe what they originally thought they would do. Yeah. But I do think that having all of these entrepreneurs who do have a bigger impact in mind in the same place and having them be able to talk about that and understand that they're not alone and they, it's, you know, they all have this bigger impact in mind. I think that that probably helps a lot with, yeah. um, you know, when you can't necessarily tell your investor that. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, thank you for joining us, and it was very exciting. And please, uh, I want to add applause for Emily. Thank you so much.